Now, without further wait, I'm very honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Corey Siegel. He's the Section Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and the co-director of the IBD Center at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. He's a professor of medicine and of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. We are very excited to have Dr. Corey Siegel join us this evening. I'd like to now have him begin his presentation. Thank you, Rushi, for the nice introduction, and thank you all for joining. Uh, as mentioned, we'll talk about achieving remission and the different types of remission and how we can get there through this treat-to-target approach. The first topic will really try to help understand the different types of remission, and we'll use the terms clinical remission, endoscopic remission, and histologic remission, and the importance of going beyond clinical remission, and I'll, I'll try to explain why that's so important. We'll discuss the treat-to-target approach of managing IBD care, and then some advice on how you can best work together with your provider to reach your desired targets and goals, which is not easy to always have these conversations and make sure you're on the same page. So let's start with some definitions here. What does it mean to be in remission? Well, there are different types of remission in IBD. The ones that most people think about are clinical remission. That means no symptoms of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, feeling well, like you never had inflammatory bowel disease. And that's what we all want, and that's what we all want for you. The term steroid-free remission takes that one step further. That's not having any symptoms, but also being off of all steroids, such as prednisone. And many of you know that prednisone does help treat those symptoms, but have both short-term and long-term complications and significant side effects that we'd like to stay away from. So you might hear the terms clinical remission, and then steroid-free remission. And we'll keep coming back to these definitions over the course of this talk. The other two, which are really important and will play a very relevant part of the discussion with treat to target is this idea of endoscopic remission. What this means is we do a colonoscopy and it looks normal. It looks like there's no evidence of active Crohn's disease. Maybe there's some scarring or evidence of prior inflammation of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, but truly no active inflammation when looking through the scope. And this is the report we all wanna to give to you and that you would receive when you have a colonoscopy that says everything looks great. You could still take it one step further and that's what brings you to this definition of what's called histologic remission. The word histologic comes from histology, which is how cells look under the microscope. So as you may know, uh, gastroenterologists when doing procedures will take biopsies in your colon or in your small bowel. And they'll look at those biopsies under the microscope and you can tell if there's active inflammation. It could look normal the way it does in the picture uh, in your colon through the scope, through the camera and on pictures, but on biopsies, there may still be some inflammation. So if we really wanna get into the very best remission, we want not only sim no symptoms, but no symptoms off of prednisone with a colonoscopy looks normal. And then even going beyond that, the biopsies look normal. You can't always get there, but when we talk about targets or goals, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. So why should you care how it looks through the scope if you feel fine? And I talk to my patients all the time about this and they say, I feel great, I'm off steroids, I feel fantastic, the medications must work. But it does beg the question, why? Why is it important to push beyond just feeling well and making sure that you have more than just a clinical remission or even a steroid-free remission, but again, an endoscopic or even histologic remission? Well, this is what happens if you only treat symptoms. Symptoms can go up and down. And as mentioned, even prednisone can make symptoms go away. But let me orient you to this graph if you haven't seen something like this before. If this is time, we can start on the uh, left side over here is uh, let's say this could be today and going down to the right could be a couple of years from now. And the red line are symptoms. So these are flares of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. You could be feeling well, have a flare, get better, be in clinical remission for a number of years even, have another flare, get better, and then on and on. But with every one of these flares, even if you feel better and get yourself off of steroids, the blue line, and as it goes up over time, is damage to the intestine. And this is particularly shown here with Crohn's disease, but you can see the same thing with ulcerative colitis. And it's really important to keep this in mind, that even if you're feeling well, in between those flares, if there is active inflammation that we can see through the scope, 
even if you're feeling fine, can still cause damage to the intestine. And that damage is often irreversible and you might need a surgery to fix it. It's not that surgery is the worst thing in the world. It's not. Surgery could be a wonderful treatment for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But our job as gastroenterologists is, try to, is to try to prevent those complications and treat the inflammation in your bowel to the very best of our ability. So you might say, well, I feel fine. I haven't had a flare for a while, maybe years. Do I still need testing and treatment? Do we still need to keep looking in there during a colonoscopy or get uh, imaging tests like a CT scan or MRI or stool tests like something called fecal calprotectin and blood tests that you do routinely. Well, here's the problem with feeling fine and an assumption that many make with how it might look in their bowel. This was an old study. You can look at the year that this was published in 1990. We've learned a lot about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis since 1990. And again, this is fairly similar with ulcerative colitis as well, but I'll show you for Crohn's disease here. On the side going up here on what we call the y-axis, this is symptom score for Crohn's disease. So we have a scoring system we've used for years. Higher scores are more active disease, meaning more symptoms. Lower scores are less active disease. And this area down here is where you would be in remission, meaning feeling well without any symptoms. Here's the endoscopy score. We also have a scoring system for endoscopy. The higher the score, the worse the disease. The lower the score, the closer you are into remission. If you think about it, it seems like it should look like this, that the more symptoms you have, the worse the score is gonna be, and vice versa, the worse the score is gonna be, the more symptoms you have. But in fact, when you look at what really happens, when you ask people with inflammatory bowel disease, particularly here with Crohn's disease, how do you feel? And then you match that against how their colonoscopy looks. It doesn't look like this. It looks much more like this, meaning you just can't tell and you can't be sure based on symptoms how it looks inside. And again, how it looks inside, even if you're feeling well, is what can dictate the risk of having these complications and bowel damage, such as the strictures or narrowing or what's called penetrating disease, where you can develop fistulas with holes from one piece of the intestine to somewhere else in the body. So it's really our job as gastroenterologists and other providers taking care of you and taking care of your families that we, of course, care, number one, about how you feel, but also how it looks inside and get things healed as best as we possibly can. Here's some work that I did with a colleague a number of years ago where we looked at how many patients who are totally feeling fine have inflammation in their bowel. So the question to the patients were, how do you feel? And all of the patients on this graph said they were in remission. They had no symptoms of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. However, when you looked inside with a, with a colonoscopy or did biopsies, you can see that about half of patients, when they felt fine, had active inflammation that you could see through the scope or active inflammation on biopsies. And you could see here, this is both. They had active inflammation on biopsies and through the scope. It was only one third of patients about that actually were in remission and had healing of their bowel. So again, just asking people how they feel, unfortunately doesn't get us there. And this is why we often wanna look and look and look and make sure that we're really getting things as healed as possible inside. The way I think about this and the way I talk to a lot of my patients about this is it's like if you had a forest fire in your backyard and you called the fire department to come and they spent a few hours putting it out and they left and it looked like this and they said, oh, it's good enough. It's pretty close to being out. You know that as soon as a strong wind comes along, it's going to catch fire again, spread even further and cause more damage. And it's not that different from what we're dealing with the bowel. We don't want it partially out. We want it as out as possible so that that inflammation will go away and that the remission won't just be for a week or a month or a year, but for years to come so that we can keep inflammatory bowel disease under control as best as we can for a very long time. The other consideration is of colon cancer. And when there's active inflammation in the colon, even if you feel fine, it significantly increases the risk of colon cancer if you either have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease that affects the colon. So trying to get that inflammation under control, not just to prevent damage and prevent flares, but also to protect against cancer. It's easy with other things that we deal with all the time. We all know 
that a sunburn is bad for your skin. And if you get repeated sunburns, that's a great way to increase your risk of skin cancer. But that's obvious. You can see it. It hurts. You feel it. But if you're feeling well with inflammatory bowel disease and you have active inflammation, it's like having a constant sunburn that's always causing damage and possibly increasing your risk of colon cancer. So really, these two ideas here of trying to get that fire totally put out and trying to prevent inflammation so you prevent damage, prevent your risk of cancer, and do everything we can to keep you feeling well as long as we possibly can. And that's really the essence of this idea of pushing to different targets. And this is exactly what Treat to Target is all about, is make goals or targets and keep pushing the most that you can. Sometimes pushing is a little too much. Now, I have a comment on that a little bit later, but push to the best of your ability to get you feeling great getting you back to feeling what is most important, uh, allowing you to do what's most important to you, but also trying to get the bowel healed and keep it healed for as long as possible. So what does treat to target really mean? Well, we have to find our targets. I've already told you from the provider standpoint, we're trying to heal that bowel, make the biopsies look as normal as possible. Have you tell us that you feel in remission, meaning no symptoms, and off of steroids. And that's really the overall target the, the providers have, but we recognize that it's more than that, that we don't just need a healed bowel to make things better. We need you happy and we need your lives back to as normal as possible and feeling that you can do everything that you wanna do without inflammatory bowel disease getting away, getting in the way. And that's not always so easy and we fully recognize that, but we do have to define what these goals are before we get there. So it's really both. It's about healing that bowel and also understanding what you need and you want to feel better and have inflammatory bowel disease in, uh, on the back burner as much as you can in the back of your mind and not something that you're thinking about all the time. So this idea of treat to target was not invented by gastroenterologists. It's actually a concept that's been in medicine for a while. If you or anybody you know has diabetes, you might know we're always going to try to get this number, this hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of how high your blood sugar levels are as low as possible. Uh, it, with rheumatoid arthritis, it's not just about feeling well, but it's about those x-rays looking normal and the inflammation going away. And with blood pressure, which is a pretty common concept, is we know that our targets are certain blood pressure numbers and lower cholesterol numbers to help prevent heart problems. So this idea of targets, again, is not new. It's just newer to inflammatory bowel disease and the way that we're trying to think of things as opposed to simply saying, how are you feeling today? And leaving it at that, where we've already talked about why it's so important to go beyond that. So what is our target or goal? Is it endoscopic healing? Is it healing on biopsies? Well, yeah, that's part of it, but ultimately it's about you and it's about how we can get you there. So if you think about a target moving from outside to inside, the first thing is we need to get you feeling better and we need to get those symptoms under control. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. What comes next is this idea of clinical remission, feeling great. I feel great. My symptoms are under control. Things are terrific, but you might still be on steroids. So we have to try to get everybody off of prednisone and other types of steroids to get that bowel healed. We talked about this mucosal healing. This is the picture here of the colon. And this idea of deep remission, meaning, boy, I am off steroids, the colon looks great, the biopsies look great, and that's what leads us to the longest and sustainable remission over time. And when we do that, we get to the center of this target, which is really changing the course of the disease, meaning we have stopped the progression of the inflammation, we have stopped the progression of damage, We've prevented a surgery, and again, we get you back to a normal and high level of a quality of life that everybody deserves who has inflammatory bowel disease. I put this together a couple of years ago, and I'll admit that part of it was in talking with patients, but part of it is also my perception of how I hear my patients talking about inflammatory bowel disease. And if you think about it, uh, like your psychology class, uh, probably psychology 101 class from college or, or high school, if you think back to Maslow's hierarchy of need, if you remember that concept, that it was a pyramid. And at the very bottom of that pyramid were some very basic things that people need. You need shelter, you need food, you need water. And then as you move up, you start getting into things like you need love and relationships. Uh, you need a good job. 
you need financial uh, success to keep things going in your life. And only at the very top do you get to this concept called self-actualization, meaning you've really realized what you can do as a person and provide to yourself and to society. I think about inflammatory bowel disease somewhat in the same way that when you hear providers talking about our goals of care, we sometimes start up here, which is we need your colon looking better. We need your biopsies looking better. We need everything healed. And I've explained why I think that's so important, but we often forget your side of this, which is hold on. Of course I want things healed too, but I have a lot of work to do before I get there. How about first off leaving the house without worried about having accidents, going back to school or work so I don't have to be fearful of flares and how I'm gonna manage that, dealing with my fatigue, my bleeding, staying out of the hospital. And then finally, we can get higher here for remission and then how the colon and the biopsies look. So these are all important, but we as providers have to remember that there's a progression and you as patients or family member of patients need to remind your doctors, it's not as simple as just let's get things healed. We have some other things we have to address first that are a more immediate impact on your quality of life and really need to be solved before you get to the fine tuning. So if we think about different targets, again, from a provider standpoint, it's about clinical remission with steroid-free mucosal healing. That's the terminology we throw around at meetings and when we talk to each other as, as doctors and other healthcare providers. But really what we're saying is we want you to feel like you don't have IBD, you're off of steroids and your bowel looks normal on colonoscopy. And that's what this means. Clinical remission with steroid-free mucosal healing means the same thing as feeling like you don't have IBD, you're not taking steroids like prednisone and your bowel looks normal. So the patient targets part is up to you. And this is where I think it gets more interesting. And most providers don't think about this all the time to ask you what's most important to you. And we have a project that's part of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation called IBD Chorus, where we often ask our patients, I won't say we often, we always ask our patients at every visit, what is your most important target or goal? And you're allowed to say anything. It does not have to be steroid-free mucosal healing. It could be, I have a wedding coming up this summer that I really want to feel well for. I'm going abroad next year, and I want to make sure that I'm uh, on medications that I can travel with and that I stay well. I want to stay off of medications because I'm scared of side effects. There are a lot of different goals and targets that our patients come. And when we ask our patients, we get all different answers. This is work done by a wonderful young doctor named C.S., who is at Brown, uh, who works with Dr. Samir Shah, who will be up in the program a little bit later with one of the sessions. And CS helped us with this project to ask patients from all over the country what is most important to them based on the responses we get when patients come into clinic. And I don't put this on here so I can show you all the different answers. I put this on here to show you there are a lot of different answers. And we, again, as healthcare providers, have to recognize the fact that, that goals are come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and that we have to respect the fact that maybe fam family planning or cost of care is so important to you that day that that's actually more important than thinking about getting off of steroids or getting your symptoms completely in remission or steroid-free mucosal healing, which your doctors will wanna to talk to you about. It's not to make one thing more important to the, than the other. It's really just to recognize that there are multiple goals coming from both the provider side and the patient side. CS turned this into a great word cloud. And as you might know with these word clouds, the bigger the word is, the more often we heard that from patients. And you can see here that the ones that you think would be big are big. We wanna get symptoms under control. We wanna be in remission. We wanna have fewer flares, less diarrhea, less abdominal pain. But there are lots of other things that we hear here, even including anxiety, fear, and worry, or attending social events and leisure activities that could be just as important as these other things. And again, it's up to you as patients or family members of patients to be proactive and talk to your providers about this and make sure that that number one concern or goal or target is in line with what your healthcare provider is working with with you to achieve that goal. 
Now, some goals aren't always accomplished. I mentioned the IBD course program where every visit we ask patients what their number one goal or target is. Here's one of the forms that we use to collect it. The question is, what is your number one treatment goal or target related to IBD? And you can see that this patient, and this is real, we didn't make this up, wrote, they wanna live forever. And then here it says, how confident are you that you can reach this goal? And I think that was very fair that they said 0%. But I don't show this to make light of the situation. I, I show this to show you that this is the kind of way you should be thinking about this. What is your number one goal or target that you have at every office visit with your provider? And then how confident are you that you can get there? Is this something that you think you can achieve? And if not, what can we do as providers to help you achieve it? So both targets are really the same. This idea of mucosal healing and histologic healing, but also getting you back to what you need to do and want to do in your life. And with permission, these are all of my patients where I ask them to often send me pictures doing the things they love doing once they get feeling well enough to do it. You can see these are all from Northern New England, of course, that's where I live up in New Hampshire. Uh, that skiing is a pretty uh, a big deal up here. Uh, this is one of my patients uh, mountain climbing. Uh, this is one using uh, uh, his motorcycle uh, with these fat uh, winter tires. And then this is my buddy uh, who all he wants to do is feel well enough to get out there and fish. So again, what's more important, all of this stuff or this? They're both important because you can't get to one really without the other. And if we get to this without allowing you to get back to your life, then we haven't done our job. And our job is to try to fulfill all of these and get you feeling well, get your bowel healed and prevent complications of inflammatory bowel disease over time. So what we need to do is help each other connect the dots is what is it that are about our patient's goals and what is it about our goals that we could show how they're totally tied together. And you need to talk to your provider about your goals, about your targets and your hopes related to management with IBD. And you always need to remember, and we say this as a mantra many times in this IBD chorus program we have, is that there are two experts in the room. It's not just the healthcare provider who's an expert in treating inflammatory bowel disease. It's you who are expert in living with inflammatory bowel disease. And for the most part, we don't understand what it's like to have and live with this disease but we're expert in helping you get your lives back and helping give treatments to get your bowel healed and looking the way it does in those normal pictures that I showed earlier from the colonoscopy. There's one important part of this and really one caveat, which is targets are goals and they're not always attainable. And we can't always get there and it can be frustrating to try and try and try and change medications every couple months, increase the doses, change to another medication. And I take this from the author Voltaire, who quoted, uh, perfect is the enemy of good. If we try to get everybody's bowel healed and the biopsy is normal, like the pictures I showed you before, we're oftentimes going to go through all of our medications in the first one or two years of treating inflammatory bowel disease and we'll be out of drugs. So we need to be very careful and thoughtful about how close can we get you there. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It could be that you're 70 or 80% of the way there, and that's great. If you're feeling well and managing your life and your quality of life is back to where you want it, we've done a really good job. So again, it's not all or nothing. And this concept that perfect could be the enemy of good. So how do you talk to your provider about these targets or goals? And we know that many of these visits are very provider focused. We come in with a million questions to ask you. We have a rush 20 minutes to get in, see you, write our note and, and, uh, and, and move on. Uh, to your day and, and us move on to our next patient, but we have to be thoughtful about this and we have to recognize how important this is to really realize where you're coming from. So number one, ask your provider about their targets or goals. Ask them when they're changing medications, explain to me why that is. What are you seeing on the colonoscopy or maybe the MRI or the CT scan or labs or stool tests that are driving a decision, even if you're feeling well, to make a change? Their goal should be this idea of clinical remission with steroid-free mucosal healing. Remember the other term that we used here, which is feeling great, like you don't have inflammatory bowel disease and off of steroids. So that should be your provider's goal in trying to get you better. But you need to tell your provider about your targets and goals of treatment, and this can be anything. It doesn't have to be something about what the biopsies look like. It doesn't have to do anything about your diarrhea or abdominal pain or bleeding. It could simply be, 
I have a graduation coming up in a few weeks and I need to be there. And please can you do anything you can to help me get there? We need to hear that because if we don't hear that, our goals are never going to be online. And remember, try to connect those dots. The idea of clinical remission and steroid free mucosal healing or the target is totally connected to probably everything you want, which is putting inflammatory bowel disease in the background of your life as much as possible. So those two things are totally connected. We just have to help each other make that connection. There's more on this. Uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation with some colleagues of ours have done a very nice video about treat to target. So if you're interested, you could find this uh, by going to the uh, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation homepage under patients and caregivers and partnering with your doctor. And there's a very nice video going a little more in depth about treat to target and why that's so important for inflammatory bowel disease. And with that, I will again thank uh, Arushi and the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Thank you for tuning in. And I think we have enough time for some questions and I would love to hear if you have any questions or comments or thoughts about this topic. So uh, thank you, Arushi, and thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Siegel, for such an informative presentation and sharing your expertise with us. Um, we uh, do have a few questions already for you to answer and invite the audience to continue submitting questions to the question box in the live discussion. Um, and um, as they do that, I just want to remind everyone to please fill out the post-webinar evaluation survey. Um, for your convenience, the survey can be found in the chat box as well as the post-webinar follow-up email we'll be sending. Um, thank you in advance for filling this out. We really appreciate the feedback and it will help us plan future pro uh, programming. Um, so moving on to our questions here. Um, the first one I see is, is there an upper age limit for uh, colonoscopy? Would you do one on a 90 year old? Oh, that's a really great question. This comes up all the time, not just for inflammatory bowel disease, but for anybody. You know, we, we try not to make age a particular cutoff. You know, there's some 90 year olds who are in a lot better health than some 60, uh, 60 year olds. So, you know, it really depends on what our goals are. It, you know, if we're looking for uh, cancers, uh, you know, we typically stop looking, you know, sometime in the 80s, depending on overall health and overall life expectancy. Um, because cancers, when they develop, you know, they don't develop overnight, they do take some time. And if we haven't seen anything for years and, and someone's never had a colon cancer, you know, and they're 85 years old, the chances of developing one is extraordinarily low. And as age goes up, the risk of colonoscopy and anesthesia and even being at home taking the prep, if you're not stable on your feet, could, could be a problem. For Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, you know, it's, it's somewhat the same thing, but if you still have active symptoms and you're really miserable and we're trying to get it under control and we don't know if the medications are working because of the disconnect that I mentioned earlier about how people feel and how it looks inside, then we do colonoscopies. I've done a colonoscopy on a 90 year old trying to understand how we can get things under better control. Uh, but in general, you know, after the uh, 80 or so is when I start thinking maybe the risks of this procedure outweigh the benefit that we're going to get. And we try to not do them unless we really think it's important. That makes um, sense. Um, I, a follow-up question here is, um, is colonoscopy the best test? Oh, it's a loaded question, I think. <laughs> Um, so it depends, you know, it's, it's, it's the best way for us to understand what's really going on inside. Now, with that said, uh, we recognize you have to take a colon, uh, bowel preparation for that. And I haven't met too many people who enjoy the current bowel preps that are out there. Uh, it requires taking a day off and getting a driver and all the things that go along with it. And there's some risk associated with it, although very, very low meaning once or twice out of four or 5,000 times people have colonoscopy, we can have complications. So it's unusual to have a complication, but they occur. Uh, but it does give us the very best information to really help us. There are other ways to do it. That's what CT scans are for and MRIs are for and blood tests and stool tests. And a stool test that you may have had before, uh, something called a fecal calprotectin, can really help us understand how much inflammation is there. They're not quite as good as colonoscopy. So when you want the real answer, you know, the, what we call the gold standard answer, a colonoscopy is the best way to go, but there are other ways to do it. And, and surely you can't have a colonoscopy 
you know, once a month or, or every couple months. Uh, but when we're trying to get people's inflammation under control and we're starting new medications, it's not unusual for us to look four months later or maybe six months later, and then maybe again another six months or 12 months later to make sure that that forest fire is out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question here is, um, is it common for patients to have IBD with IBS uh, where there is uh, endoscopic or a histologic remission, but a patient continues to have symptoms? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very important uh, concept, and there are two different ways to look at it. You know, one is anybody can have IBS. IBS is the most common reason people come to a gastroenterologist's office anywhere in the world. Uh, and IBS, for those not familiar with the term, is not an inflammatory problem. It's irritable bowel syndrome, typically constipation, diarrhea, and most often alternating constipation and diarrhea. And anybody can have that. And having Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis doesn't make you immune to also having IBS. Now, with that said, having inflammation and then healing the inflammation could lead to some damage to the way that the bowel squeezes and absorbs water. And some people, even after their inflammation has gone, have what I call a post-inflammatory IBS, meaning things aren't squeezing the same, water isn't being absorbed the same, you could have not normal bowel movements, you could even sometimes have constipation and things don't work exactly the way they should. It's probably a result of prior damage from inflammation and another reason that we really want to get things under control with this idea of treat to target. And the quicker we get things under control, the less opportunity there is for damage of the bowel to have these type of side effects occur. Right. Um, this question's a li little off topic, but I think they specifically want to ask you for your input. Um, the uh, person saying that they are a UC patient and they do believe that diet plays a huge role. So mm -hmm. they're just um, asking for recommendations on what to eat um, and what to avoid. And I understand this is a very large question to answer, uh, but um, I don't know if you had um, some input here. Um, I will plug in that we do have a webinar specifically focused on diet and nutrition coming up in June. Great. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet this is a topic for a whole webinar. I'll tell you my approach to this as opposed to, you know, specific recommendations, because that is hard, is we, we've learned a lot about diet over the years. You know, when I was training in gastroenterology, um, the answer was diet doesn't matter. Diet doesn't matter. Don't worry about diet. Eat whatever you want. Unless it makes you feel sick, then don't eat it. And I think we've become more sophisticated in this and recognize that for some people, diet matters. And some people, it doesn't matter that much. You know, I have patients with terrible ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, and they could eat anything they want, and it doesn't bother them. And others with mild inflammatory bowel disease that are very sensitive to certain foods, and it makes their life really difficult. So the, the way I think about this is diet is complementary to your treatment. There are very, very few people who go into remission, true remission, meaning what I talked about, endoscopic, looks normal through the scope, biopsies look normal, off steroids. There are very few people who get there with diet alone. Diet can be used, however, in conjunction with medications because A, eating healthy is really important, and B, certain foods definitely make people feel better or worse. We're starting to learn that certain diets might help decrease inflammation, and there are a lot of very strict diets out there. Many of you probably know about the specific carbohydrate diet, which is very, very strict. Um, there are exclusion diets where you really stay away from a lot of foods. Um, more popular recently, and actually a, a, a much easier diet to be on is something called the Mediterranean diet. And all of these might help. And in fact, um, uh, working with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, there was a recent research study uh, with a clever name called DINE uh, for people with Crohn's disease that did show that actually diets do make people feel better. We don't know how much it really decreases inflammation and heals the bowel. So that's where the problem is, is we never wanna recommend a treatment that we think is only gonna get you part of the way there. And although you said, Arushi, that that was off topic, it's actually perfectly on topic because the, the idea is, is get feeling better is only part of it and healing the bowel is the rest. So diet is a great thing to think about we're going to learn a lot more in the future as we learn about something called the microbiome, which are all the bacteria that live in your gut. And you can only imagine that the microbiome 
co composition or makeup is de partly dependent on what you eat. So we are gonna learn more about this over time and we're getting there. And the good news is there are a lot of people thinking about this, a lot of smart people really thinking about this to try to figure out how we might be able to personalize diets for different people. But again, we're, we're not there yet. And I urge you, if you're interested in using diet complementary to your treatment, absolutely, it's a great idea. But if you're interested in doing it as the only treatment, it concerns many of us because we just haven't proven that it really gets things as under control as we've talked about tonight. That's a very good point. Um, another question is, if someone is doing quite well on medication and is considered in remission, is it conceivable that they might come off of medication and stay in remission? Yeah, this is a, a really hot topic in our field now. And it's, you know, I love that we're talking about this because, you know, 15 years ago, we weren't talking about stopping medications because we weren't getting enough of our patients into remission in the first place. But now that we have better drugs and we're learning how to use our drugs even more effectively, we have a lot of people who ask this question, which is great. I'm feeling great. Can I come off my medications? The, the word that we use is de-escalate therapy, meaning if you're on three drugs, can you go down to two drugs? If you're on two drugs, can you go down to one drug? That we are learning is probably a safe thing to do in some patients. And there's actually a huge global research trial that was just completed that looked at this exact idea. The results aren't done yet, but maybe Arushi will let me come back and talk about that next year sometime, but we'll learn who and how to safely de-escalate therapy or cut back from again, three drugs to two drugs or two drug to one drug. What we haven't been totally comfortable with is going from one drug to no drugs. And most of the time that, that results in a flare, if not within the first six months, within the first one to two years, the majority of people end up having their inflammation come back. Now there's sometimes you can get away with it. And if your inflammation and your disease was never that bad in the first place, and you've been in remission for 20 years, it's not unreasonable you know, to think about stopping that one drug that you're on, but you really have to do it carefully and when I do that with my patients, I make sure that we check all those things we talked about earlier, blood tests, fecal calprotectin stool tests, a colonoscopy probably six months later, and maybe even an x-ray like an MRI or CT scan six months after that. So if you do it, it should really be in close collaboration with your provider. Perfect. I did make a note of that. So I guess we have a topic finalized for next year, please. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, there's another question here about, um, is there a correlation between IBD and hormones? Oh, that's interesting. This just came up uh, in my clinic on Monday, actually. And uh, they're probably, so, uh, you know, that question might mean a lot of different things. I'll, I'll tell you what it means to me is that, you know, men and women have hormone levels that go up and down over time. And the best model for this, of course, are pregnant women, where hormone shifts are huge swings, you know, up and down before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy. And we see some very interesting things happen, you know, with hormones, meaning people who haven't been in remission for years go into remission only when they're pregnant. Um, uh, people who have been feeling uh, great for a long time flare during pregnancy or right after pregnancy. So there probably is a connection between hormones and hormone levels and inflammation, but that's not something that we have quite understood yet. And it might be because it's on an individual, you know, person, patient level that it's, it's hard to figure out because everybody's a little different, but there are some interesting things that occur. And one just last point on this, Arushi, is that many women I take care of tell me around the time of their menstrual period, you know, more than just the typical menstrual symptoms that they had, but they really feel like they flare once a month. And oftentimes we could change the form of birth control or put people on birth control. So there's a steady level of hormones throughout the year, as opposed to withdrawing at the end of every month and having a menstrual period. And, and when you keep the hormone levels consistent, many people feel much better like that. Perfect. Um, let's see, there are a few more questions here and I did skip over a few just because I think, uh, you know, within best interest of time and then also we have our breakout sessions and I think some of these questions will get answered there. But um, probably one last question that we can take here is, what is your experience with dual biologic therapy as an approach to CD? 
Yeah, uh, so thanks. So for those of you who, who may not know exactly what that question means, uh, you know, many of the drugs we use uh, that you've heard these terms are biologic drugs. So drugs that are actually made from cells. So these are the drugs like infliximab or Remicade, adalimumab, which is Humira, other commercials you see on TV, and Tivio, Stellara, these are all biologic drugs. And many of them work by different mechanisms, meaning through different chemical pathways. If you think about other diseases that we treat, uh, like HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C, is we were not making great progress using one drug at a time. And that's often what we do when we treat inflammatory bowel disease. They were able to essentially cure and get HIV into remission, cure hepatitis C, when they started combining different drugs and using these different mechanisms coming from different angles. So we're starting to do that now with biologic therapy. I do believe that in general, it's a safe thing to do. Uh, we, we have some data on this that shows it can be effective as well. Uh, research trials that uh, get drugs approved and get people comfortable taking care of patients generally typically might have 500 or 1,000 people in it. Right now, with this idea of combining biologic therapy, the research studies that we have are something like 20 or 30 people. So we're not quite there yet in our comfort level, in safety, and what the right combinations are. But I will bet good money that over the next years, we figure out how to combine these medications and we get people getting into remission more often than we ever have. Um, I guess we do have time for one last question. I think this is right. uh, you know, speaking on the topic of trials. What uh, considerations should a patient make regarding attempting to enter medical trials? Yeah. So. You know, anytime I meet someone who is interested in a trial or we're presenting a trial, I say you know, two, two criteria have to be met. Number one, you have to be interested in being in the trial yourself and, and hope that this medication helps you because either other things didn't help you or uh, you're interested in trying something new. Number two, which is equally as important is that you have to be in this for others as well with inflammatory bowel disease because everybody in clinical trials doesn't even get the real drug. There's this placebo arm in almost all trials where you don't get drug, but you get something that looks like the drug, but it's not active. And unfortunately, that's really the only way for us to understand if the drug really works and how to get new drugs approved. So I make clear to anyone who's going into trials that of course you want to get better, but you have to recognize that even if you don't get better, you're helping others for now and the future and future generations of people with inflammatory bowel disease. The other thing, and I guess the last thing with clinical trials, and maybe this is the last thing we have time for, Arushi, is that clinical trials are not for people who've just failed everything. You know, matter of fact, you know, people, if, if for any of you who've been on five, six, seven different biologic drugs, you know, that's not exactly the right way to, to try out new drugs. It's often earlier. If you've tried one drug, you know, like you tried one of the biologic drugs and it didn't work, all the other drugs that are approved and on the market are, are still going to be available in a year from now. But that clinical trial often only is open for like six months or 12 months. So you have this opportunity to be the first, you know, one of the first people in the world world to, to use a drug that might be very, very effective for inflammatory bowel disease. And we already know a lot about safety when these drugs get to that point. So we're pretty confident that they're safe. So I would urge anyone who's interested in clinical trials to talk to your provider about this. Don't wait until everything has failed and you want to try one more thing before surgery. That's not the right time. It's to do it sooner and to recognize that even if it doesn't help you, you're helping many, many other people by helping us get new drugs on the market. That's a great uh, suggestion. And I uh, do want to remind um, our audience that our webinar last month was specifically on that topic of clinical trials and the recording is available um, on your uh, in your swap card account. So feel uh, free to uh, view that at your convenience. Uh, but I think that's uh, all the time we have for questions. So again, I want to thank you, Dr. Siegel, for your time this evening uh, and presenting on such an important and relevant topic to the IBD community. Um, we would like to remind our attendees to fill out the evaluation survey at the end of tonight's program. Um, and as we move on to the next segment of the evening, our uh, breakout sessions, 
Um, I just wanted to uh, quickly go over how you can join uh, that session. Um, you can either go to the agenda for March and click on the breakout session you would like to attend, um, and it will open up the page you can see on the screen right now. Um, or if you selected the session previously, you can find it under the My Event tab. Um, and on the left corner, uh, which is circled in uh, red on the screen right now, you will see a link in purple to enter the breakout room. Uh, once you do click on that, your breakout session will open in a separate tab. Um, and if you do have any questions about the same for video, uh, type them in the chat box and we'll try to get you to the right place. Um, so enjoy your breakout sessions uh, and thank you for joining us here. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.